Is that on the screen for us? Let's read this in unison. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known to all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you establish your faithfulness in heaven itself. Amen. We're going to turn to 372 in the hymnal, Living for Jesus, a whole pair of four verses.
Well, we have some announcements before we do get into the rest of our service, so if you take your bulletins out, I think most of these things are printed in the bulletin, but we do have some extra items to take a look at this morning. First of all, we have some birthdays and anniversaries coming up for the month of November. And Sandy Swanson, who's gone today, has one coming up very quickly, then Gloria Garcia, Eddie Jimenez, Debbie Sutherland, Jennifer Martinez, Kayla Barrett, and Mark Sutherland. Mm -hmm. Wow. And some anniversaries. Dan and Mary Coswell. And Boyd and Virginia Gatfield. So we want to wish everybody a happy birthday and a happy anniversary as well. <clears throat> All right. Tonight in our evening fellowship hour. I'm going to take it right here. <clears throat> First of all, we be here at uh, 5.30 and we have... A time where we have some fellowship, kind of almost like a mini potluck with one for one another, and we'd love to have you come at 5.30 and enjoy that. But then at 6 o'clock, we're going to show a video, and it's a very interesting video. It's The Secret History of Islam Exposed, and the main speaker is Bridget Gabriel, who is Lebanese. She grew up in Islam. She grew up in the war. She was a refugee. She's come to the United States. She became a believer. And she wants to point out what Islam really is, not to be deceived by what we're told. And so we'd encourage you to come out very, very, very enlightening. All right. Then in our adult Sunday school class, we're taking a look at the book of Acts. Today we took a look at Acts chapter 15. Very, very enlightening passage of scripture. The first Jerusalem council. We'd love to invite you to join us. And then the ladies are getting together here on uh, Tuesdays, and they're meeting at 10.30 over here in the overflow room. Good time of fellowship, and right now they're in the book of Proverbs. And then on Wednesday nights, we have a time when we get together just to pray. That is it. It's not a Bible study, it's just a prayer meeting. And we've got a lot of things a lot of people will be praying for right now. Operation Christmas Child. Yay. Do you have anything to share this week? If you like. Huh? Sure. Okay. She has different stories that she's been reading for us, and so we'll invite Debbie to come up and do that. But again, they're meeting at 10 o'clock, and they are packing shoeboxes now. If you take a look here at the front corners of the sanctuary, you'll see packed boxes already. Yes. 
two boys who needed the good work both of a long friendship and the lesson in finding joy. And I think that that's what happens when each box is opened. Um, there's each joy. So, have a challenge. This week, I'd like you guys to each learn a verse and then share it with somebody. So right now, we have a video that explains why we're doing what we are doing. We wanted to go very far to find a missed cruise. And we heard about this village that the persecuted Christians usually stole people who come to establish the church here. We prayed for one year and uh, I decided to meet with the chief of the village. Ça a changé beaucoup de choses à l'envers des petits enfants. Souvent, quand ils vont, comme on appelle à l'église, ce que le pasteur Isaac l'a écrit, il l'a écrit. Though this chief wanted some change to come in this community, he couldn't take the necessary step until his children received a key box. We want to come here and talk about Jesus. When we came to the boxes, there was a lot of commotion in the village. And that day, when we distributed, they were so happy, smiling, they were dancing. La, en ce qui concerne les boîtes cadeaux, en tout cas, en l'équité, ces boîtes ont apporté un grand changement. En ce sens que, tout d'abord, lorsque les boîtes sont venues, il y avait eu une, une grande joie dans le village. Et puis, nous sommes arrivés à commencer la déception de les enfants. Nous avons vu qu'il y avait des changements dans la vie des enfants et même dans le commitment des commitments de la ville. It is true that God gave us a vision, but without the gift boxes, I figure out that we might have not been able to accomplish that vision. So here is a situation where God changed an entire village due to the shoe boxes. They prayed for an entire year and they could not get into this village with the gospel, but because of shoe boxes they could. So anyway, what an encouragement. So, we are dedicating our coin jar project to the shipping costs of Operation Christmas Child. And so far, $2,509.69 has come in. So, keep it up. We have until the end of the year. And, of course, right now, Operation Christmas Child is recommending $10 a box because it costs to ship boxes around the world. So, we've got enough for about 250 boxes already. But uh, our goal is to actually do more than that, so great. Very good. So our men's fellowship is getting together also on Thursday mornings at 11 in my office. Also, Nick Barrett has put together a list of some plants to help beautify what I call the west side of our church building. This is where the ramp comes up and where the stairs come up and we put some rock there. And so anyway, the Howard Street side is the east side, this side is the west side, and uh, anyway, so if you'd like to donate some plants, we have a list on the back table. Our annual meeting is coming up, and we would love to have everybody come and join us for that. That is on November the 9th at 10.30. Then, this morning, we have a special guest with us. We have a new member. And we want to embarrass her thoroughly. So we want to have Bonnie come forward. Trouble. And you can talk to Bonnie. It's not that hard. We don't get out the thumb screws. We don't get out the rats or anything like that. But we do want to welcome Bonnie uh, into our midst as a brand new member of our church. And so she's going to qualify to vote at our annual meeting. Who knows? Maybe we could even make her some sort of an officer. Anyway, we're going to lay hands on her and pray for her. And then afterwards, we want to thoroughly embarrass her. We want her to stand at the back of the church so people can extend their right hand to fellowship. Okay? All right. So, Dan, will you pray for Bonnie as she joins our church?
traditional thing when she stands at the back and you come and greet her, you have to ask her, Bonnie, do you know where your car is? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Welcome, Bonnie. All right, moving right along, we have the Thanksgiving potluck coming up, and that is November the 17th at noon. And we'll be giving you some more instructions as time goes along. We've already had a turkey donated to one of the families in our church, and they're going to fix the turkey. Uh, now, I know that Norm Cox wants to have a roast. So, yeah, we will, we will make sure that a roast gets fixed, but there's other things as well. So, as we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, I don't know where to begin. Again, as I put in the bulletin, uh, please pray for Israel during this time. Check your news media. Things change daily. So some of the things that have happened this week, as you know, they've been at war with Hezbollah. They're launching rockets back and forth. But they've also been uh, at war with Hamas and Gaza. And the world, including the United States, told them, Israel, whatever you do, don't go into Rafah. Rafah was a major city along the Egyptian border, a real strong point for Hamas. Well, Benjamin Netanyahu and Israel did not listen to the rest of the world. They went into Rafa. And this week, they saw three terrorists trying to escape. And to make a long story short, they killed them. And when they went in to investigate, they looked and they looked at one of them. They thought, this looks like Sinwar, the head of Hamas. They actually took samples. They confirmed it was him. And Israel has killed the leader of Hamas. This is the man who was the terrorist who was the mastermind behind October 7th, all this brutality, all this killing, all this war. Also, as you know, uh, Israel has been trying to work out an arrangement to have a ceasefire or release hostages or whatever. Sinwar was the major stumbling block to this. When they examined his body, they found multiple passports, $11,000 in cash, and they think he was going to escape across the border into Egypt. Well, they got him. So, Hezbollah, being very upset with what is going on, sent three drones into Israel this weekend. One of them was not shut down. It made it into Caesarea, where Benjamin Netanyahu and his wife had a private residence. Apparently, they were trying to target Netanyahu. He was not home. Uh, this drone did minimal damage. But again, now Israel is dealing with the fact that they are trying to kill Benjamin Netanyahu. So Caesarea is a very, very important place. And we've shown some videos on it. In just a second, we're going to show you a video that was filmed in an amphitheater. I have actually been in that amphitheater. I have sat in those seats. It is a Roman amphitheater that looks over the Mediterranean Sea. And a thousand Israeli musicians got together as a fundraiser to try to help bring these hostages home. So watch this for the next few moments. Bring them home. Oh, by the way, at the very end, Steve, shut it down and I'll tell you to. Okay.
Very good. So again, from what we've been told, there are about 100 Israeli hostages still being held hostage, and some of those are American citizens. So this is their prayer. Bring them home. So we need to be praying as well that the Lord will bring them home. Again, the major obstacle in that happening was this fellow Senor Sinwar, and he is now dead. As we move on to Alliance Burquist, if you take a look in your bulletin, it talks about Hurricane Milton. And again, uh, major, major damage in Florida. This follows the Hurricane Helene that affected Florida and Georgia and uh, North Carolina. So uh, we need to be praying. So far, the re reports are pretty good coming out for Alliance facilities and people. But again, we need to be praying for that situation. So, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your love, and Father, we thank you that we can be praying for one another. We thank you for Operation Christmas Child and for the effects that it is having. These are not just boxes and toys and other goodies. Father, you're changing lives. You're changing whole villages. And so, Father, we just pray that you would be with this project. Father, we pray for Israel today. Father, we know that they are having desperate times. And Father, things seem to be getting worse. But Father, as we know, your word says that it's going to get worse before it gets better. Help them to look to you. We pray for many that they'll be saved and look to Jesus as their Messiah. And then Father, for our alliance workers around the world, we would pray for even those in our own country today that have been affected by these hurricanes. Be with them. Strengthen them. Help them. For it's in Jesus' name. surgery on Thursday morning. I'm sure she would appreciate our prayers. I don't know her last name. Mary Ellen Farr. Oh, Mary Ellen Farr. Okay. Okay. We'll be praying for her. Okay. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your love and we just thank you that you will work in our lives. Please be with us. We pray for all these names. Again, Father, you know more about them than we do. Father, we pray that you would meet every single need, whether we physical, psychological, spiritual need. Father, we pray for the surgeries, we pray for travelers, help them all. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. All right, we've got a couple here. First of all, the uh, Through the Bible Reading, and I hope that you have been doing that. If not, 
We'd love to encourage you to join us at any point. And if you don't know where to read, just let me know, and I'd be happy to send you some uh, scriptures to take a look at. But anyway, we were, first of all, in Jeremiah 26 and 27 this morning. And uh, I wrote several things down in my little guide. Uh, again, these are just important to me. They might not be important to you. But first of all, were the plots to kill Jeremiah. You know, God told Jeremiah to go do this. Go speak these words. He goes and speak these words. And what do the people do? Instead of repenting, they just want to kill him. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, and that would be encouragement to us. When things don't always go the way we think they should be. Then you have the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar. And <clears throat> Babylon is going to come down and conquer the whole area. And what I think is very interesting is that Nebuchadnezzar is referred to as my servant. My servant. Now how could this evil, wicked king, this emperor, be God's servant? And yet he was accomplishing what God wanted him to do. And then we have some promises that they will return. Yes, they got to go to Babylon, but uh, only the good ones are really going to return because God has a plan for them. Then in, in Proverbs chapter 11, verses uh, 12 to 21 again, you have these contrasts over and over again from the wicked and the righteous. And then reading in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, 1 through 2, 8, I wrote down this one phrase. There's a lot of stuff going on there, believe me. But I wrote down, we did not come with flattering words. Paul, when he went to Thessalonica, came to preach the truth. And he did it in a very simple, straightforward way. They may not have always liked it, but again, he wasn't trying to impress them with his rhetoric, but rather to teach the word. All right, before we get into the message, we have a couple other slides, I believe, I hope. First of all, how do people start attending church? Okay, the pastor. Okay, you know, the pastor's important, right? Obviously, he invites people to church. People say that only 6% of people who are in the church are there because of the pastor. What about advertising? Some churches spend thousands of dollars on advertising. Only 2%. All right. What about organized visitation? A lot of churches send out teams, and they go door to door, and they knock, and they do all sorts of things. Maybe 6%. What does that mean? 86% of people involved in a church are there because somebody befriended them and invited them and encouraged them. We call that friendship evangelism. So that's a very striking set of figures. Then one more. Gary Stewart told me I had to put this up. What can I say? <laughs> this pastor has an awesome congregation. So I don't know. I don't know. Are you awesome? Yeah. Yes. You are. Okay. Great. All right. Let's move on. I'll be quiet. <laughs> this congregation has an awesome pastor. Well, that I don't know about. So yeah. I know. I give you a lot of. Yes, you do. <laughs> you do a very good job at it. No, we praise the Lord and thank you that you are a man of the word. Oh, you want to read this quick time. Amen. All right. So we're going to go to Matthew chapter 26 this morning, verses 1 through 13. And we're going to talk about Jesus predicts his death. Now, for a number of weeks now, we've been in what is called Passion Week. Why do we call it Passion Week? Well, it's because Jesus came to Jerusalem at Passover for one reason, and one reason alone, to die. He knew that he was going to die. He knew that he was going to sacrifice his life. And so we refer to all these events as Passion Week. Now, believe it or not, we are finally transitioning out of Tuesday afternoon. How many weeks has it been? I've lost track that we've been on Tuesday. One thing I hope that you realize, if you study the Gospels, you have Jesus' birth. Then you have very little about the first 30 years of his life, maybe at age 12, you know, when he goes to the temple. Then you have three years of Jesus' ministry. But really, a lot of the Gospels have to do with that last week of Jesus' life. And so we have taken a look at all these events, all this teaching, all these parables.
Corinth that took place there. So as we transition now out of uh, Tuesday afternoon, there are some who say that Jesus' death was a tragedy and a failure. Ever heard of the Reverend Sun Young Moon? Did you know that Reverend Moon believed that Jesus was sent by God? But he failed. Yeah, he failed. He got killed, so he wasn't able to do what he was supposed to do. So God had to wait another 2,000 years, and along comes Reverend Sun Young Moon. And he was going to redeem the world, except he's dead now, too. Hmm. I guess that didn't work out very well for him. But we're going to see that this was not a tragedy. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't some plot of the Jews or the Romans. But this was all predicted by Jesus. We're going to see that Jesus is going to predict his death. And then we're going to see an event. And i got to be honest with you, I did some research this week on this event. I found out something I really perhaps didn't know before. It may not have happened right when we think it happened. So you're going to have to stay awake so you can learn this. All right? Our key verse this morning will be in Matthew chapter 26, verse 2. You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to be crucified. The point that we want to make is simply this. Jesus clearly predicted that he would be betrayed and crucified. This is not an accident. This is not some fluke in history. This was all a part of God's plan. And so the question that I need to ask myself is, have I come to fully understand why Jesus was crucified? Is that, have I really come to grips with that? Have I come to grips with the fact that God actually became a man and actually lived among us and actually died a horrific death on the cross on purpose? We're going to talk a little, take a look at that, a little bit about that. All right, two things. Plotting for Jesus' death and anointing for Jesus' death. First of all, plotting for Jesus' death. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 26, it says this. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples. So when Jesus had finished all these sayings, in Matthew's gospel, the teaching of Jesus is finished here. In these last days leading up to his betrayal and crucifixion, he warned the multitudes about the corrupt religious leadership. And he spoke to his disciples about things to come. Now it was time for Jesus to fulfill his work on the cross. So there's no more interactions back and forth uh, like there was at the Temple Mount in all these parables and all this teaching that just took place. It's time for him to do what he came to do. Verse 2. You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to be crucified. So, Passover's coming. Jesus is going to be the Passover lamb. This is going to happen as a result of a betrayal. And this death is not going to be just some heart attack or some disease. He is actually going to be crucified. Having instructed his disciples and the Jews by his discourses, edified them by his example, convinced them by his miracles, he now prepares to redeem them by his blood. Okay, this is one of the absolutely most important parts of scripture. Jesus' death on the cross. Verse 3. Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, who is called Caiaphas. We've got to stop there for a second. What is being talked about here? Well, the high priest who was called Caiaphas, Annas, was deposed by the secular authorities in AD 15 and replaced by Caiaphas, who lived and ruled to his death in AD 36. But since, according to the Old Testament, the high priest was not to be replaced till the, after his death, the transfer of power was illegal. Doubtless, some continued to call either man high priest. So this man is a political appointee. Rome has deposed the other one. Rome has put this man into place. So they did get together, and verse 4 says this, and took counsel that they might take Jesus covertly and 
kill him. You understand what's going on here? They want Jesus dead. He is bad for business. He is bad for their religion. They don't like what he's doing. They don't like the fact that he's raising people from the dead like Lazarus. They want Lazarus dead too. All right? The long controversy between Jesus and the religious leaders had finally come to this. Now, according to Carson, the use of both assembled and plotted is deliberately suggestive of Psalm 31, 13, where it says, For I am the slander of many, fear on every side, while they take counsel together against me, they scheme to take my, away my life. So again, everything that is happening is the fulfillment of prophecy. Verse 5. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar. They didn't want to put Jesus to death during Passover, but that is exactly how it happened. This is another subtle indication that Jesus was in control of events as they in fact killed him on the very day they really didn't want to. The leaders were right in fearing the people. Jerusalem's population swelled perhaps fivefold during the feast, and with religious fervor and national messiahism at a high pitch, a spark might set off an explosion. So they're concerned about the politics of it all. All right, so that's the plotting for Jesus' death. Now let's talk about the anointing for Jesus' death. Here's where you got to stay awake, because I learned some things this week. When Jesus was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper. All right, stop. When does this take place? Matthew, Mark, and John seem to include it in the events surrounding Passion Week. Luke speaks of a similar event that happened earlier in Galilee. John, however, is more specific than Matthew or Mark and tells us when this happened. When Jesus arrived in Bethany at the beginning of the week, Matthew and Mark included where they do to help emphasize the fact that Jesus is going to die. Now, if you don't believe that, look in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 12, verse 1, it says this. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. They prepared a supper for him there. Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pint of very costly ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the ointment. So, the scripture says that Simon the leper is otherwise unknown to us. He was presumably a well-known local figure, perhaps one of whom Jesus had cured, <coughs> as one who was still a leper could not entertain guests to dinner, but whose nickname remained as a reminder of his former disease. So, again, all three of these Gospels are talking about the event that happened around Fashion Week, but John makes it a little bit more clear that this happened when he first got there. So why do Matthew and, and, and why does he put it in where he does? It is to again emphasize the fact that Jesus knows he's going to die. Now it says in verse 7, a woman came to him having an alabaster jar of very expensive ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at supper. A woman came to him having an alabaster flax we know from John 12 that the woman was Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha. Mary, who sat at the feet of Jesus in Luke 10, 39, made this extravagant display of love and devotion to Jesus. Now, what's the thing going on here? Well, Morris, I love this guy. He's one of the greatest commentators I've ever heard of. Okay? His name is Morris. It says about the alabaster flask, it had no handles, and was furnished with a long neck, which was broken off when the contents were needed. We may fairly deduce that this perfume was costly. Jewish ladies commonly wore a perfume flask 
suspended from a cord around the neck. And it was so much a part of them that they were allowed to wear it even on the Sabbath. Well, verse 8 says, When his disciples saw it, they were really impressed and complimented the lady for what she had done. No, that's not what it says. When his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, For what purpose is this waste? This ointment might have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. Why this waste? The disciples criticized this display of love and honor for Jesus. Specifically, the critic was named who? Judas. Judas. We find that in John 12, 4 through 6. He was the keeper of the money bag. He probably wanted the money for himself. Verse 10. When Jesus perceived it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? She has done a good work for me. What they call waste, Jesus calls a beautiful thing. It's all a matter of perspective. Verse 11. For you have the poor always with you, but you do not always have me. For it says you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. Jesus did not say this to discourage generosity and kind treatment of the poor. But the fact was, Jesus was going to die. In pouring this anointment on my body, she did it for my burial. By the way, did you know that kings were anointed? Priests were anointed? Each of these would have been true in the case of Jesus, yet he claimed that she anointed him, not as king, not as priest, but as sacrifice for his burial. She probably did not know all that her actually action meant, but she anointed her Lord for his burial. The consequences of the simplest action done for Christ may be such greater than we think. We see thus show that there was at least one heart in the world that thought nothing was too good for her Lord, and that the best of the very best ought to be given to him. Verse 13. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told in memory of her. So what this woman has done will also be told as memorial. What Mary did was remarkable for its motive, a pure, loving heart. It was remarkable in that it was done for Jesus alone, and it was remarkable that it was unusual and extraordinary. So here we are in the year 2024 in Walla Walla, Washington, and what are we talking about? What Mary did. So there's the plotting for Jesus' death, there's the anointing for Jesus' death. Now, let me ask you a question. What is a memorable moment? Say that ten times fast. What is a memorable moment? Well, what Jesus, what was done to Jesus by Mary was definitely memorable. The woman's act was an act of faith. The woman's act of anointing Jesus was an act of faith in him as the Messiah, the anointed one. All right? The woman's act was an act of love and respect. The woman's act was, was an act of love and respect for Jesus. Not just for anybody, but for Jesus. The woman's act was a beautiful thing. Jesus said that the woman's act was a beautiful thing that would prepare him for his burial. The woman's act was an example of sacrifice. The woman's act was an example of sacrifice that should inspire followers of Jesus. This was of great value. The woman's act was bold and extravagant. The woman's act was bold and extravagant and to some even seemed inappropriate. The woman's act was a moment that lingered. The woman's act was a moment that literally lingered for all those who were near Jesus. For the rest of that evening, that whole place smelled like that beautiful perfume. So what is our key verse this morning? Matthew chapter 26, verse 2. You know that after two days is the Passover... And the Son of Man will be betrayed and be crucified. Again, the point is Jesus clearly predicted that he would be betrayed and crucified. The question is, have I come to fully understand why Jesus was crucified? You know, there's a lot of people today, if you ask them, they say, well, I believe in Jesus. Oh, yeah, I believe he was a good teacher. But do you understand why he came, why he died? Father God, we thank you for your love and help us now to appreciate even more what Jesus has done for us.
For it is in his name we ask it. Amen.